My name is Aisa Abdullah Ali, and I'm also known as Clevin Raphael Holt. I would call myself a professional soldier of Islam. I am just one individual who has gone to many places in the earth seeking justice for those who were being ill-treated and oppressed. Basically, that's who I am. It was an inspiration that was sent to me by way of God through his angels. It was a sensation inside of me that was so strong that I just couldn't ignore it. So I had to act upon it. The highest level of faith is when you see a wrong being committed is to stop it with your presence, with your hands. The second level is to speak out against it with your words. The lowest degree of faith is to hate it in your heart and continue on about your way. I've had to deal with racism. It's another form of oppression. I would stand up for myself. So I felt a lot better about myself that I would stand up in the face of these types of oppressive acts. As long as we don't really look at the jihadi or jihadist phenomenon from within and really let jihadis tell us their story, regardless of what we think of jihadis, I don't think we'll be able to understand why they do the things they do and why they believe in the things they do. When he talks about what motivates him, what makes him tick, where he came from, what he's willing to do, it's wise to listen to him. I mean, he's putting himself in harm's way for what he really believes is real, or what he really believes is true. Have you killed a lot of people in the name of God? Yes, I have. I didn't murder them. I fought in battles against them. They were armed, I was armed. And had I not taken initiative, then I wouldn't be sitting here talking with you today. I actually stopped counting in uh, 1981. I stopped counting the numbers of persons only I had killed, and that had, I had stopped at that time at 173. There are countless numbers that I, I don't even know to this day. When I was growing up, I thought everybody loved me and I loved everybody. And I thought that, you know, all the world was kind and nice and then when all of a sudden we moved up into these other neighborhoods, I started finding out the hard realities that not everybody was in, of that mindset. There were some really ill people out here. You can call them Allah, you can call them Buddha, you can call them itsy bitsy spider, but we are a family who loves God. Our mother was a very young woman with a lot of children. 29 years old at one point with seven children. We lived in, in a uh in a project community, but it was a different era. Probably one of the most dangerous neighborhoods you don't want to be in right now. And we used to always have these little street battles uh, with, with P Street and Q Street over the play playground, right? My mother is one of those people that she's very controlling. The background that she came from was abusive. You know, she had an a, a overly religious, passive mother and a uh, an insane kind of father who sexually abused her and her sister. So with those kind of issues, sometimes in raising children, it makes it even more complicated. Issa and I have the same father. Um, different ones of us have different fathers. But he was an alcoholic and a sexual abuser. He abused me sexually. So we have those issues. And those issues color can color your life for a long time. Vengeance, listen, is too heavy a load for any one of us to carry. Strychnine does not destroy its container. Arsenic does not destroy its container. 
Bitterness is the only poison that destroys its container. Bless us and make us a blessing. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, when Easter came to live, we, we would go to church like a prayer meeting night, Tuesday, Wednesday night, and then Sundays. Uh, and, and sometimes we'd be in, in church on Sunday all day. Coming out from being a gang leader and, and coming to find life in Jesus Christ, I felt that was very important. I felt that it was very valuable. I wanted to always have a, a, a type of relationship with God that allowed intimacy. And that's what I tried to convey to, to Isa. Because it was just too much confusion, too much madness, too much abuse going around, not just with me, but it was just every which way I was turning. It was just madness. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. God bless you all. I'll see you all in morning service. Think and tell that the same way kids get drawn into gangs when they grow up in extremely violent surroundings. Kids will get drawn into terrorist groups. When I first met Issa, and Issa is raised in Washington, D.C., okay, he refers to Washington, D.C. as a colony, plantation. In this area of D.C., one of the larger gangs was known as the uh, Imperial Saints. And these guys were really some bad news. It was something like maybe 200 strong. So uh, that's where I began to meet the Imperial Saints. He was, you know, kind of a gawky kid, okay? And he was the subject of a lot of, you know, um, violence. So they pulled my shirt off, pulled my tie off, right? Take my lunch box, eat my lunch and everything, take my book bag and take everything, just throw it all over the place and then slapped me upside the back of my head and took my money from me and told me that from now on, when they see me every day, I have to pay taxes when I come through that door. They've always considered Uncle Nate as being tough, coming from an ex-gang leader kind of existence, uh, growing up in, in a very hostile environment, you know, and I had to be very tough, very hard. And, and But I didn't see that kind of hardness in Issa. When you grow up getting beat up, okay, you get a you you have a complex, okay. That complex manifests itself in a, you know in a real reaction. And I just started banging his face into the sink until the whole thing turned red. His buddy was hitting me in the back of the head, and I grabbed him and bit him up on out his ear. And all I remember was something in my mouth, and I spat it in his face, and then it was nothing else said. I was very clear that uh, despite the fact that Malcolm X had been. Uh, killed by black hands, that the government was behind that. I was also, you know, aware, as all blacks were, okay, they didn't, couldn't prove it, but they all felt that somehow Martin Luther King, his death was not simply the result of a deranged racist, that it was somehow a government-sponsored uh, action. Decapitation of the black power movement, the death of the civil rights movement, all of that represents a subtraction of alternatives for mass organizing, for attempts for people to control things. There is no alternative. Sometimes you get push comes to shove and you basically just got to get yourself out and hope that you can survive in another environment. What were you the first time you ever fired a gun? Fifteen. Where was it? At Fort Dix, New Jersey, in the Army. At moment of firing something that only spoke one language and that language was death, you know, it sort of gave me the feeling like I had some serious power in my hand. The Army had offered me, it was sort of like taking an orphan off the street and saying, okay, I'll take the responsibility of raising you like my own son. Then they gave me a good education, taught me how to defend myself. And the most thing of all, it taught me, you know, it's like this is how a father is to be towards son and daughter. In the beginning phase, you know, it was all American, you know. And then when I got to Camp Casey, South Korea, that attitude changed completely. And then as a result of all the experiences I had in Korea, I became a black national.
when I got off that plane and we were going down the stairs and I looked around and then this awful feeling just came over me. And I looked around and I said, there has to be something more than all that I'm seeing in front of me now. And we started walking through the crowd. People were spitting on the soldiers. I mean, throwing all kinds of shit at them and calling them a bunch of baby killers, right? There's a level of uh, rage or insanity or something that I think a lot of black people in this country possess. So I had gone up near this cornfield across the street from the junior high school that I had attended. And I sat there with the intent of getting myself, you know, psyched up to go to Silver Spring and get up on this high point and just start shooting white people. I sat down, I assembled the M1 carbine, and then I loaded up the 38. And I didn't hate anybody up until the point when I got into the Army, right? That's when I really started hating white people. With meanness from black people, racism from white people, yes, there was a point where he was angry. Because none of this shit was making any sense to me as to why I'm feeling and thinking and living the way I am. And I missed my brother, the person that he was when he was little and the person that he is now. He was angry you, could, you couldn't reach him. And then I just took the pistol, I cocked it, and just before I pulled the trigger, an angel said to me in a voice that shook my soul, he said, that you do this, you will spend your eternity in hell. Dropped the pistol and then standing there and I just wanted to almost like kill something. I got peace for the first time in my life that I had ever felt like that. And then three days later, I got my answer. That's when I met Musa. I'm a person that hate racism on any level, you see what I'm saying? And um, that's one of the things that I realized in Islam, that there was no racism. There's a moment of crisis, and it's very appealing to have this structure of a, of, 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 of a faith brought to them, which can give their lives meaning, into which they can uh, subordinate their own individuality, feeling they're joining a cause larger than themselves. He also told me that he had made a prayer to God, to God, to, to show him, to give him light, to give him guidance. Especially for individuals who've been sort of lost in the ghetto, uh, a part of a, of a youth gang, uh, having no future ahead of them, the, the, there's something really quite positive psychologically about joining a faith, be it Christianity, uh, Judaism, or, or Islam. The first liberation is the, is the understanding of uh, who you are in relationship to God, and who you are in relationship to other men. You understand that then your relationship to other men changes. And that in itself is a liberative experience. It was for me. Beliefs are very powerful. They take hold of people and they, uh, they, they change them, or they change their nature, or they, they exploit their nature uh, toward a different kind of physical confrontation. You do what you're trained to do, you see what I'm saying? I was trained to invite people to the oneness of God. I was trained for that. Issa was, had that military training, and he wanted to put it to good use. I said, if someone gave me a plane ticket, I would go over in the Middle East and I would fight with the Arabs. But Muslims have a right to defend themselves regardless of who attacks them. If I got up and hit you, and hit you in the face, you got a right to hit me back. An eye for an eye, a life for a life. You really cannot understand what happened in the 1980s and 1990s without understanding what I call the global awakening uh, within Muslim communities worldwide. I can say I was greatly influenced by the words of Ayatollah Khomeini. A lot of what he had said in the past matched everything that I ever thought, ever felt, and even some of the things I would verbalize. His discourse was anti-imperialism. His discourse was anti-Zionism. All those things, you know, uh, they struck chords with me. My learning experience through Islam 
the answer starts becoming more and more clear. The American hostages were blindfolded, handcuffed, and marched out on the U.S. Embassy's front steps by the revolutionary students. I first became familiar with Clevin Holt, also known as Issa Abdullah Ali, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when he was believed to be a member of the so-called Islamic Guerrillas of America, or IGA, a group that was sponsored by the Iranian intelligence service, operated out of Washington, D.C., and primarily recruited black African-American Muslim converts to do their bidding for them. The relationship between me and Issa, okay, we were not, you know, we were not uh, uh, really so actively engaged with doing anything, okay, until uh, we came to work at the, the Iranian embassy together. In 1980, the IGA utilized another African-American convert, David Belfield, also known as Daoud Salahuddin, to assassinate Ali Tabat Tabai in Bethesda, Maryland. Tabat Tabai was the former press attaché for the Shah of Iran, and he was an enemy of Khomeini. David was able to escape uh, Washington and the United States, and we know he ended up in Iran, where he was employed by the Iranian intelligence service. In fact, that's where he is today. The targeting of Mr. Tebetabai, that was uh, an Iranian call. It was a sense of uh, what I knew about American imperial history and uh, the number of coups and assassinations that had been carried out uh, because people had taken power in other parts of the world who they did not like and who they wanted to remove. And Khomeini had somehow entered that arena. had to offer was my military skills, which is not so great and so grand, but it felt like something special to me. And I know it's extremely difficult for some of us, some, some of us uh, who are basically secular individuals, to understand how some activist would basically, in the name of God, in the name of religion, would basically sacrifice their, their life in order to defend their communities and their religion and their nations. ولذلك فقد كانت الثورة الإسلامية تمثل الحركة التي تقود تعمل على أن تقود المسلمين للتحرر من هذا الضغط الغربي. I had a little misery in my life, but I didn't have any reason in my life. And when I got here, that's when I found my reason for living. They took me to a taxi on the Burj Khayyad in Burj Daraj. I was tied to him. I was tied to him with a faith and a faith. I felt with a faith and a faith that I was going to be a person. From what I knew, he, he was fighting with the uh, Amal militia. He's tall, about six foot three, dressed in uh, U.S. Army camouflage fatigues. He had a, an M16 with a telescopic scope. He had a, a U.S. Army helmet, uh, binoculars, canteen dagger, the, the whole gear. <laughs> So imagine my surprise on top of this incredibly volatile political situation to spot Issa Abdullah Ali in the mountains of Lebanon, who, who appeared to be trading Amal and Hezbollah operatives, many of whom were female operatives. <laughs> على وجهه أو العملية التخفي وإلى آخره كانت طلفة النظر وتشد الشباب صوبه وكان عنيف كثير للشباب. When he got to Lebanon, he didn't so much find the answer in Islam. 
he found the answer in in war, in in being a, a, a fighter. I felt like I was like a part of death. And the Israelis were dropping all those bombs all over the place from the sky. It was very chaotic, pervasive lawlessness. A lot of times it wasn't clear who was fighting whom in the streets of Beirut. And I started talking to the angel of death, and I told him straight up, I said, look, you need to like, get inside of me, you know, and take all these human characteristics away from me. Why was the Israeli invasion such a pivotal event in the history and the politics of the Shia community? It radicalized and militarized the Shia community of southern Lebanon. The fog parted, morning sunlight came, and we arrived at the port, and it was just absolute chaos. The, the port is right on the Green Line, the most dangerous place in the world at the time, right there. You could feel things simmering. It, it was going to explode at any minute. The Palestinian issue hadn't been addressed. The Iranians were in the Bekaa Valley. We knew they were trying to get influence, get a foothold in there. The adrenaline rush, the gunpowder, the cordite, constant battles taking place here and there. You're shifting, maneuvering 24 hours a day. Yeah, it was a serious drug. I mean, it was a serious get hot situation. Patience. What it takes to be a sniper is patience. Even if you don't have, you know, that ultimate train, that high level of training, it takes a whole lot of patience. It could be a building, it could be on, on the ground. I mean, sometimes just to get 100 meters, it might take me something like two or three hours to get to one position just to take out that target. I didn't want to be seen, I didn't want to be heard. And I saw this guy coming down the road, and I first I sighted in on him. And I'm looking at him, and I can see on his epaulette that he was an officer. So I then I followed this guy, and then suddenly I just started thinking. I said, wow, I said, this guy looks like he's a family man. And I'm sure he has a mother and a father, wife and children. And then I said, they're going to miss him. I just said, fuck him, and then I put that lead on him and pop, that was it. I didn't feel anything except the recoil from my rifle. The bomb that blasted the American embassy in Beirut left at least 30 dead. At least 100 people were injured. Fanatical supporters of Ayatollah Khamenei say they did it. The more blood I saw, the more blood I wanted to see. And I just, and it was just almost on a daily basis of killing and killing and killing and killing. Go kill Americans, go kidnap them, um, kill whoever you had to, kill the, the, the prime minister, uh, and on and on and on. There, there were no limits. To wake up one day and see your neighbor's friends looting your own house, to see your neighbors attacking your own town, uh, to see brothers killing each other. Uh, Lebanon became a nightmare. We are in the fight against the threat of the freedom. Because we believe that we are the leader of the Imam Musa Sadr. We are in the fight against the freedom. Musa Sadr is the Martin Luther King of the Shiites of Lebanon. What Sayyid Musa Sadr did was to transform a highly marginalized and disfranchised community like the Shiites into an army of activists. He gave the Shiites political hope and political courage to really demand its equal share in the social and political process. لا نمارس نفس العمل اللي نحنا عم ندينه وعيسى كان من ضمن المجموعات اللي بأمان 
يعني يدين هاي الاعمال اعمال الخطف وحز الحريات A Frenchman named uh, Christian Jobert and uh, an American Frank Regeer who were kidnapped and uh, and they were held for I don't know a, a, a month 40 days something like said, well, you know about the American who came with Amal? And I said, no, I don't. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah. There's this, this American guy, he's a former special forces, and, and he, was, he was directing everything. He was telling them everything to do and how to secure the building and all of this. And I went, do you remember his name? And, oh, something Isa or something like that. Amal occasionally would fight with Hezbollah people taking the hostages and they would go in and rescue people and then I got a, a very serious warning from the Amal spokesman drop this story don't ask another question about it just be done with it I didn't have compassion or anything of that nature, but I still had a level of humanity that would keep me from going to a level when I've seen people commit massacres and that's just not the shape of my soul. In some cases I've actually put my presence at risk because I knew it was the right thing to do. Other times I've spoken out, even though I knew that my words would be, you know, not accepted by many. We knew who Issa was, the CIA did. A part of Amal was working with Iran, but the faction that Issa was working with was not a terrorist part of the network. I frankly don't think that they would trust Issa inside that network because he was an American. There was, um a lot of resentment among the Lebanese against foreigners who were running around in their country with guns. During my time here in Lebanon, many persons would say to me, we think you're a spy. You know, there's a belief that a large number of people you're dealing with are Mossad agents or CIA agents. Uh, they see the hand of intelligence agencies everywhere. I've been approached by the CIA in, in the past and on many occasions. If he was CIA, I would know it. There were no such things at, in Beirut at that time as completely compartmented operations. The only possibility, and I can't exclude it, is he worked for the Department of Defense. It got gotten to a point that I knew I was no longer in Lebanon for the reasons that I had come there. Because in that period of time, the people had turned on each other. I hear pop, 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 pop. From that, this point here, I turned around to look because I think that the shooting was down that way, but instead, the guy was coming out of his car shooting me. And then at the same time, I was watching my clothes jump like this. And then when I saw the blood spill out of this artery, that's when, you know, it just dawned on me, I'm getting shots. Reached back, pulled my 45 out, popped two rounds in him. There's people standing around me watching me die. And I said to him, I said, Sodney, put me out of Mustafa. And then from that point on, we went to uh, the American University Hospital of Beirut. That was like a really beautiful, peaceful moment. Being between this life and that life, and then you're seeing into eternity. And that was like one of the most peaceful moments I had ever seen. Yeah, all the madness, all the insanity of what I had seen over the years and even before my coming here, I knew that I was going to be free from this life. But that wasn't the plan of the Creator. I don't hate Jews, I don't hate Christians, I don't hate Muslims, I don't hate any person. I just hate the sick, the mad, the ill that comes out of us all, even myself, okay? So that's what I'm at war with, even myself. 
Some analysts believe that homegrown terrorists could pose one of the greatest threats to Western societies uh, because they have a familiarity with Western culture, they have an ability to blend in. He's the ultimate insider. He speaks perfect English, he's been in the military, he's got the uniforms, he's got the American passport. What I've seen in my own study is the pride of a cause which transcends a lost individual life. And joining this larger social group which has this defined cause then becomes very, very powerful psychologically, gives the life meaning. I see the cause, uh, the ideology, as being like an exoskeleton, like an insect has, which holds that person together. And you dare not challenge that At the time I tracked him down, he was uh, way overweight, and not happy with his body, not happy with his life, not happy with his income or his job. He hated the people he worked with. It just wasn't going right for him. And as far as uh, death or anything is concerned, I welcome that. It's because this life is shit to me. Maybe not to everybody else, but to me it is. Issa speaks with this, this boilerplate terminology. When he talks about military affairs, he's got boilerplate military stuff that comes straight out of Soldier of Fortune magazine. Then when he talks about the oppressed and justice and serving at the, at the pleasure of God, that's more boi boilerplate that he's read somewhere else and memorized because it sounds really good in front of a television camera or in front of an interviewer. He came to us uh, first as our trash man. He was a trash man for Howard University, and he, we were down the street back then, and uh, he came around and offered a deal that you know he would pick up our trash while he was out getting theirs as well. So he started working doing the trash thing, and then he started working security for us until uh, you know, he came to me telling me he was uh, going to go to Bosnia. When you're concerned about someone uh, being uh, linked into, uh, at the very least, into a foreign power, Iran, uh, into a designated terrorist organization, Hezbollah, and you know, expressing a desire to, uh, expressing glee at fighting and killing people, and uh, having no regrets and saying he would do it again. Uh, that's the kind of thing where, where you know, the U.S. might want to uh, consider you know, indicting him upon his return. The bottom line was he wanted to die and he wasn't going to um, uh, arrive at that moment by being a groundskeeper at Howard University. This is what I came here for, either to achieve victory in this life or to achieve martyrdom. And like I say, my life to me does not end with this world ending, it begins. When I'm 18, I start to have dreams. Most I have dreams like I'm in a war and I'm in a partisan. They say here, all people say when the, you know, people start dream or children, they play too much war and uh, you know, something won't happen. Wherever you go, it's the same thing. You find injustice, you find ill treatment, you find oppression. The only place I find that is ideal for me, it's not in this life. I kill only when it's necessary. And then the rest of the world is standing by, you know, just giving lip service and no action. And I see that it is necessary for me to commit myself to such a time and a place, I'll go and help those people, whoever they may be. Pored svi oni koji su jedva čekali da iziđu iz Bosne, da, 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 da odu iz te golgote i tako dalje, pojavlju se neki čovjek iz Amerike, Amerikanac, koji eto, jednostavno hoće da, da, da pomogne bošnjacima Bosni. Uh, mi u armiji Bosni i Hercegovine znate i sami da smo krenuli sa tanđarama, kuburama, puškama, pa kroz razne načine jačali i razvijali. Međutim, a, a, ali je došao opet stvarno kao američki marinac. Međutim, opet nismo bili... Mm, 
raštili kako su kompletno opremom dolazi u vrijeme embarga, sankcija prema Bosni i Hercegovini. When I came over here, I brought, I brought all my equipment. I used an Israeli uh, H-type uh, web belt on my person. I would carry 11 hand grenades. I had a 9 mm Beretta. I had my knife chucked inside of my web gear and I'd have attached to the back portion, I'd strap them in, I'd have two light anti-tank uh, rockets right side of my rucksack, I would have a machete just in case I needed that. They sent us a 93 in Zenica and Panir. They sent us, we have the, you know, training, some training about, you know, military stuff. Who, who trained you? Uh, some people from, uh, you know, Iran. Uglavnom, Ali je uspio napraviti jedan dobar tim, znači, od tih izviđača, pogotovo sa tom svojom opremom, sa maskiranjem lica, sa, znači, da ovo im je još jedan veći moral za, za borbu, a i sam on svojim, znači, stalnim držanjem, onim vojničkim, znači, ono što je nekad nama falilo da bi, da bi sačuvao glavu, znači, do, doprinosio je tome da se, da se posao radi onako kako, kako treba. They had uh, rape and torture camps, and I mean, we had gone through places like, example, in Kluch, they had killed something, I'm not sure if it's 600 civilians that they had killed, and a lot of them had been, you know, small children and infants, and a lot of the infant uh, remains that we had found, we found these large nails that had been, like, slammed into their foreheads. I could only see them as some subhuman species, and my attitude was, Wherever we find them, kill them. Veću snagu i i i pesnicu ka ne ka ne prijatelju. I ovaj, ja ja opet kažem ne želim da budem subjektivan, ali smo daleko onda još bili jači i prema ovaj. He is wanted in the United States for questioning for terrorist activities. Therefore, we take his possible presence in the country very seriously. Concern that Aisa might be able to talk his way on to an American base in Bosnia caused the U.S. military to distribute his picture to all checkpoints in the country. If he is cited, he will be detained. When we go to American embassy, they never stop us. He say no evidence, like, like, uh, FBI, you don't have nothing against him. You know, they cannot prove nothing. You don't have no, you know, like even for ticket for parking car. You know, they don't have nothing against him. In all the places that I've been and fought in wars, I've fought against men and machines, those who have either invaded or occupied somebody's country. Until I left the CIA in 1997, and I was, like I said, I was in Sarajevo and Beirut where he was. I've never seen any evidence against him that would suggest that he should either have an arrest warrant or be kept off airplanes. No one should have a reason to be afraid of me because, like I said, I'm not an aggressor. And that I had chose to be a terrorist, I'm saying in the camera, you wouldn't have known it was me. Washington, D.C. is a very dangerous place. Well, I feel more comfortable here in Bosnia Herzegovina. I mean, it's like, here you have still what you call a family system, okay? I mean, foundation, family and all. It's not as much stress and not as many people as in, in America. And uh, they're a little more old world and disciplined. When in the States, it's like, especially in D.C., me living there, it's, it's like this. When I go to work, every day I have to think, who will I might have to kill just to get to work, and then who might I have to kill on my way home? It's like there are no front lines. It's not even Vietnam. It's like wherever you turn, you never know who you're going to meet. That's just not a way to live, always thinking, who am I going to kill today? Because the people are so ill-willed and ill-disciplined. I mean, to take a man's life, it's not a really pleasant thing, okay? And to go as if you're some savage beast, you know, and this, this dark side of you comes out, that's, that's not a thing you want to show everybody every day. Plus, 
They don't have mountains in D.C. like this. What would you do when someone invades your country, occupies your land? What would you do? I'm not a terrorist. I'm not an aggressor. I'm not a war junkie. I didn't think I was coming here like the savior of the world. I just wanted to be just a part of what was taking place here and to show that they were not alone. And that uh, for them to know that, you know, they weren't forgotten. It's just like in Islam, there's a saying that we are like one body. And when one part of the body hurts, the rest of the body is gonna feel the pain. So that's what happened to me, I felt the pain. My wife and I, we've been in the same combat conditions. So, I mean, it's like, I can't sit around and mope about, oh, you know, I'm all by myself and, you know, I'm all alone and this. No, I got basically half the country who's been through this madness, so I don't feel so by myself. In moments and times that brought these guys to this place, they gave all they had. You know, and that spirit of self-sacrifice, that's what it is, self-sacrifice. And you can't forget stuff like that, no matter what land, what people. You know, when you sacrifice your life for a cause that is worth giving your life for, it has to mean something. The best thing about being alive, my family. Anybody here? Set. Say now. God there. I'd like to see them live their life you know, how they think and how they feel is best. I'm gonna do everything that I can do to enable them to, you know, fulfill many of their dreams. Because a lot of the brutal madness that I had seen, you know, men beating their wives the way they did or the types of situations that were happening when, you know, men were brutally beating their children like that and having them scream. Hey, no, go ahead, boy. Put this in the sink in the kitchen. Don't drop the dishes. Well, actually, they have asked me questions all right, all right. about my life. <laughs> and my son, sometimes when he asks me questions about my life, I, I see him sitting over there with tears in his eyes and I ask him, why are you crying? He says, your life is so sad. I said, no, man, I said, this was a good moment in life. It helped me to become a stronger and better person. You see that? That's some dirty stuff. Nah, uh -uh, no more. All the gloves off, man. You, you want to do it like that? He said, well, when I grow up, I want to be just like you, Dad. I said, no, you grow up and be better than me. Hey, <laughs> now, uh, I'm out of there. They've got mountains, they've got countryside. I mean, sheep walk down the street, cows mooing next door, and you know, and you, you hear roosters crowing in the morning. You know, you don't have the, you know, asphalt, concrete jungle. And uh, they got mom and dad in the house.
every now and then I have to shift up on them and uh, put that little drill sergeant thing in there because like I say, you know, I'm not into, you know, kicking them around, slapping them around. You see that? Yeah. In front of it. All of that, all the way around is landmines. I would never have my kids feel as though they were abandoned and just left to, you know, get caught up in the breeze. That boy runs like a snail. I know that's not a way for any child to live. And the good part about it is, is that it, it, it makes me feel good when they tell me that I'm a good father, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. But he helped me. He told me so many stories. You know, he wake up something inside, and my heart now is open more about you know Islam. As far as the Arabs believing that they have to spread Islam, that they feel as though they're out planting seeds, then hopefully they're doing it for the for the reasons of, of pleasing the Creator, rather than trying to serve some uh, political agenda and trying to manipulate people into some mad uh, conditions that are taking place here on Earth. Does any re religion own the truth? Does man truly own the Earth? We can't own the truth. No, we can walk in truth. We can live the truth. You know, I don't know about owning it. How much can you pay for the truth? Isa's story typifies the predicament of many Mujahideen uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. And I think his narrative, his journey, tells you a great deal about how history shifts and changes. What used to be freedom fighters in the 1980s and 1990s are now seen as terrorists um, and Al-Qaeda like uh, killers and evildoers. And over time I met many people who claimed to be killing in the name of God and I realized that they were doing it not really for religious reasons, that they were drawn to violence for one reason or another, perhaps political, perhaps psychological. The real Isa, I think, is the guy who was getting hit up for his lunch money at Paul Junior High and not feeling like he could defend himself and feeling powerless to do anything about it. When he finally got to, to be an adult and grew up and knew that he was big and strong, well, by God, he was going to prove his manhood. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who are going to have a problem with an African-American male, you know, being in this part of the world and living amongst what they call a bunch of white folk. But for me, that's, that's not a matter of importance because I, I can get past the, the color of the skin and go into the character of the people. People are people. And I mean, I found here in Bosnia uh, that if a lot of African-Americans came here, they would find great similarities, very much so, because I tell a lot of people here, the only difference between you and black people is the language and the color of your skin. Every day he has a reason to get up, and it's not about him, it's about others. Because it's, it's when it's all about you that you're trying to protect the you, the me, the my, that's bondage. But when you have let all that go, and you're free to love and help others. That's liberty, man. That's the reason to live. So I'm, I'm trusting in that source that put me here to fulfill its promise that so long as I stand up for the ill-treated and the downtrodden and the oppressed, that once I leave this life, I will be given a better condition than what I have here. So this is, this is sort of like the deal between me and the guy. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. 
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة